Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Know that you are welcomed into this worship time with our Bridge family. Friends, I want to confess to you that I've struggled in how to prepare to open up today's sermon. And frankly, I've had three different approaches that I've wrestled with, tried to pray through. And rather than choose one, I feel led of the Lord to share all three with you. And so know that today is going to be a day where we take our time, we slow down, and I pray by God's grace and for his glory, I pray that we are going to be a blessed people. And I want to begin one of those three ways. I want to begin by letting you know that I'm going to open and use some churchy language here at the beginning. But stay with me, because this is a message that is for the family of God. It is for our Bridge family. But if you are one who is visiting or watching and says, hey, listen, I'm not a Christian. I'm not a member of the Bridge family. I just happen to come into this, and I'm curious to see what you've got to say. Please know that this message is specifically and prayerfully for you as well, that we want to be able to bring God's truth and love, not just to the family of God, but to the future family of God. And so I promise you, if you'll stay with us, what you'll find is God's message to you, those that are outside of his family, perhaps struggling, perhaps down in the very deep pit of life's worst struggles. Know that this message is for you as well. Second way of introducing is I want you to know that today we are going to walk through God's Word in a very powerful way. Let me ask you this question. What do you think of when I say simplicity and repetition? Simplicity and repetition. Have you ever come to realize that according to God and his word, simplicity and repetition are both very strategic weapons in spiritual warfare? Let me show you by way of example. How many times does the devil, the world, and even your own flesh tempt you? Does it happen often? Does it repeat? Does it come in complex ways that you really struggle to understand? Or do you find yourself consistently, regularly, repeatedly being challenged by simple temptations? Whether it's fear, whether it's lust, whether it's some form of self-righteousness where you're just going to do things your way, have you noticed that there is repetition and simplicity in the strategy used against you in spiritual warfare? I pray that you realize this truth. For to be forewarned is to be forearmed. And know this, friend that the same is true on the positive side, that our Lord has given us simple instructions. For example, love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that all of Christian beliefs fall under that umbrella. Very simple. But no doubt you've also noticed that what is simple is not necessarily easy. So we need to understand the definition of simple. Simplicity, one of my favorite definitions, is freedom from complexity. Freedom from complexity. God and his word have offered us a simple, clear set of instructions, a blueprint for living. It's a way of coming to understand not just the word, the word, the will, and the ways of God. They're laid out for us in God's word, in the Bible. 
if we will learn the simple truths and depend on God's Holy Spirit and grace-given power, we'll be able to live this life of light, of love, of being the ambassadors for Christ, for being the very essence of the army of the Almighty. We'll win spiritual warfare when we understand the simple truth and love of God in his word. Now that leads us to the issue of repetition. Have you noticed that in the same way that the enemy does not leave you alone, God and his word repeat over and 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 over again his truth in love. The urgings that we find in the scriptures, the reminding that we have in the scriptures, the foretelling of what to be preparing for that's in the scriptures, that from cover to cover, God has repeatedly demonstrated his love for his people, his instructions for his people, his guidance for his people. Friend, I want you to know that both simplicity and repetition are very strategic weapons in spiritual warfare. Hence, our use and submission to the repeated, simple teachings of God and his word. It's not rocket science. It really comes down to simple truth and love, and then the reality of our walking in faithful obedience or not. It's that simple. I pray as we walk through 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 today, you'll see this simplicity and repetition displayed yet again. And let me repeat, I'm speaking to both the Christian and the non-Christian today. This is a message, I want to tell you, on a very personal level. Um, it's a lesson that I had hoped to preach when my dad was going to be with us. And if you're with us today, please know that God held this message for this time, perhaps for you, because it was intended to be shared weeks ago. And as God kept guiding me, this message was put on hold for another week, for another week. Well, here it is today, and I pray that you hear and heed what God is speaking to you very personally. Now, the other way that I had considered opening up the sermon was to ask you another set of questions. And you'll see, I pray, how all of these come together. My first of a number of questions is simply this. Do you, do you know what the gospel is? Do you know what the gospel is? This is where I'm using the church language. So, friend, if you're not a believer and you say no, don't check out on me. Because I'm asking the questions to reveal how important the gospel is and how to find it. The other questions were going to be, do you know how to answer the question of what is the gospel? Do you know where to find the answer? and answers to your questions regarding the gospel. Do you know how to define and describe the gospel? Do you know how to explain and apply? So it's not just whether or not you've internalized, but are you one who is able to explain and apply the gospel for others? Do you know how important the gospel is. Lastly, are you living the gospel? You see, friends, these are eternally important questions, and they come at the heart of all of God's word and teaching, and especially here in our series. We're walking through the book of First Peter in a series that is entitled No Matter What, and the context is that God is speaking to his people who are beginning to become persecuted because they are God's people. In essence, life is beginning to get hard on the Christians 
because they are Christians. It's not just their geographic location. It, it's not the socioeconomic. It, it's not based on natural disasters. The fact that these people are identifying as Christians is bringing to them challenge and difficulty. And so Peter, through the inspiration of Almighty God, see 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Peter, through the inspiration and the breathing out of Almighty God, is speaking to a people that is very much like us in today's context, where Christianity is beginning to get mocked and ridiculed. We have family members around the world that are being beaten and killed for the same reason, simply stating, I am a Christian. I am a faithful Christ follower. For such truth and love, for such conviction, and for such declaring, our family members are being persecuted and killed all around the world. And where I live here in the United States, we're not being murdered, but we're being mocked. We're being ridiculed, and our social and our legal systems are beginning to shift to where the Christian is becoming the target. The Christian and the voice of God is being not just mocked and ridiculed, but it's beginning to become attacked. It won't be long before, like other parts of the world, where I live in the U.S., the Christian will be very much like those that are being written to in First Peter, like those that were being written to in the book of Hebrews, those were being written to with the Book of Jude and 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Friend, I pray that you've come to realize that this is an application for you and for me, all of us. We live in the context of these scriptures. 2,000 years later from the New Testament, it's speaking right to where we live, right here, right now. So let me again tell you, we're going to go through our scripture three times. Simple repetition. The title of today's message is The Simple Call of the Gospel. The Simple Call of the Gospel. So we're going to look at, and I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles. Come with me to 1 Peter, and it's chapter 2, verse 21. We've spent three weeks looking at the opening phrase of this verse. Today, we're going to complete the whole verse. I want to walk through it with you and read it slowly and carefully one time. Then we're going to go back through it and we're going to unpack it carefully one time. And then we're going to go back through it one more time to display and apply it. So that today, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, three times. And in so doing, my prayer is that you'll see the simple call of the gospel in a way that will not only change your life and help you to grow in your understanding of Christ, Christianity, and the church, but I pray that this will be a message that will help to equip and build you to the glory of God, to equip and send you out with tools of truth and love that you may help others the way Christ has sent others to help you. So if you would, pray with me now, and then let's walk through 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, to the glory of God. Lord, I come to you now and I ask you that each one within the sound of my voice Prepare to have you till the soil of their heart and equip them with your truth and love. Lord, for those who are outside of the family of God, as I speak, I pray that before we are done, that you do the miraculous work of drawing and capturing more adopted children into the family. And Lord, I pray for each family member who has already been adopted be they a lover, a learner, a leader, or a lifer, wherever they are in the maturity growth process with you and for you, I pray that all of us, starting with me, 
will leave differently than the way we came, that we will literally be raised up to your glory, that we'll grow as those who pour out more of your mercy and grace as you have poured so much into us. May this be not only what we do, but who we become. Let it not be a have to, but a get to. And may the world see you more clearly through us because we see you more clearly through your word, your will, and your way. I pray it all in the precious and powerful name of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Well, friends, again, let's walk through 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. If you open up your Bible, I'm going to read it quickly, and then I'm going to read it again. And then after that, we'll unpack it, and then we'll display and apply it. So it's God's word that says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might walk in his steps. Now that's, I don't know, 10, 12 seconds to read. But let me tell you, there's a lifetime, an eternity of truth and love in that one verse. Let me, let me ask you another question. This was another way I had contemplated opening up the message today. When was the last time that you read a Bible verse or perhaps a Bible passage that just arrested your attention? I mean, grabbed you and would not let go. When was the last time you read a verse or a passage that you would say was life transforming? Even if you're a Christian, please don't miss this. Life transforming means refinement. It means sanctification. And I pray that you're being refined and changed in these ways all the time. When was the last time and or what was the last verse or passage that was truly transformative to you? I mean, it just grabbed you and would not let go. Well, it's probably coming as no surprise to you as we're now week three or four into this one verse, that First Peter chapter 2, verse 21 is such a verse for me. I think back to, for example, Psalm 119, verse 165. Peace, peace, or perfect peace, have those who love your law. Nothing can cause them to stumble. That verse had such an impact on me. I think of Titus 2.15. I consider that my life verse. Declare these things. Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. That verse defines my calling. Well, I pray that if you don't have a verse or a passage that you can point to recently, I pray two things will come of that. Number one, that this will be an awareness, a wake-up call, that if you were spending more time in God's word, God's word would spend more time in you. And that the lack of such an arresting connection to God's word is not for a lack of supply. There is so much in God's word waiting to grab a hold of you. It's really a matter of you getting into God's word. And then secondly, this is where I pray perhaps 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, becomes such a verse for you as it has for me. Because as you will see, it brings a clarity to the gospel. When I ask, do you know what the gospel is? Do you know where to find the answer? Do you understand it well enough to not only take it in, but to share it with others? Here in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, it is one of those incredibly pregnant parts of God's word that, for me, this verse will always, for the rest of my life, be one of those incredible go-to places, especially when I want to share with others the truth and love that God has graced me with, the gospel. So let's, again, just read through it. Before we unpack it, let's just read through it, and this time, let my inflection in my voice help to guide and prepare you. For to this, 
to this, to this, you, you have been, have been called. To this, you have been called. Because, here comes the reason, because Christ also suffered. Christ also suffered. So we just got an answer to what is this? We'll unpack that further, but notice, you have been called to this. What is this? Christ also suffered. The also tells you this is in part the suffering. For Christ also suffered. And did he suffer for no reason? No, he suffered for you. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. Don't miss this. It might be the most important part of the whole verse. Christ suffered for you. The second most important part of the scripture, he did this leaving you an example. Leaving you an example. Why would you leave the example, Christ? Answer, so that. Here's another purpose statement that clarifies. So that you might follow. You might follow in his steps. Do you see this? You have been called because Christ also suffered. You have been called to this. And this is pointing back to everything that we've seen prior. Most recently, the call to suffer. Prior to that, the call to service. Prior to that, the call to submission. Prior to that, to be chosen and caused to be saved as the beloved. This is what we see in chapter one, building up. So for to this, you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow, not loosely follow, in his steps. When you follow in the steps of somebody, you follow them exactly. You are literally putting your feet where their feet were. You are walking on that narrow path that he blazed. So I pray. Now, as we walk through it even further, let's unpack this a little bit. For you, notice it's personal. Don't miss the both and. It's a universal you to the church, and it's also an individual you to every Christian. And who is the you that this passage is speaking to? Well, I pray that you'll see this is the you of chapter one. Those that have been caused to be saved by Almighty God those that are described as the beloved of God. This is a writing to the authentic, true Christian, the authentic, true church, the authentic, true family of Almighty God. Now, there will be some who hear this that are not in that group, that are not in the family, but they'll hear it because they're acting like the family. They're around the family. They are in what we call the visible church. They go to church, but they're not yet truly being church. They're in the church building, but they're not in Christ's body. You need to understand this. The promises and the sweetness of what is shared is for the family of God, for you 
You, beloved, you, blessed family of God, you that have surrendered to victory in Christ, you who are submitting to the word, the will, and the ways of God, you who are serving the king and his kingdom, you who are suffering for the glory of God and standing no matter what, for to you, to you, you have been called to what? To this. For you have been called to this. To this you have been called. The this is all of what we have already seen. To the holy hope, the living hope and the heavenly inheritance. Yes, that's true. But you've also been called to the surrendering, to the submitting, to the serving and to the suffering, to the being of the church. For to this you have been called. You've not been called to get rich. You've not been called to have comfort and complacency. You've not been called to religion and self-absorption. You've been called to be the church. You've been called to be a Christ follower. What do you call a follower who doesn't follow? It's a liar. You've been called to this, to the authentic, biblical gospel of Jesus Christ. You've been called to recognize that Romans 3.23 and 6.23, they are for you. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Friend, if you find this call being personal to you as overly offensive, if you think, hey, that's not me, I'm not that bad, then you're not in this you. This you that is being talked to is the true family of God. Those for whom the Beatitudes of Matthew 5 apply. The fruit of the Spirit isn't just a wish, it's a reality. The fruit of the Spirit is in you because Christ is in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. As you go through all the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, It's for those who live in the full armor of God, for those who truly are the Christian family. This is the you here. For you have been called to this. What about the call? Who's doing the calling? If it's the you of 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2, the calling is coming from Creator Christ. For to this you have been called by Almighty God. You haven't been called by culture. You haven't been called by religion. You haven't been called by a church. You've been called by Creator Christ. For to this you have been. It's past tense. He's speaking to those who are the church, not those who would one day become the church. Although I'm speaking to many who I pray, will one day become the church. This is a message speaking to the family of God, the current believers. For to this Christian, you have been called to suffer, to serve, to submit, to surrender, to be the beloved. For to this, you have been called by Creator Christ. I pray that as we press in now to the second part, that you'll see Christ in a whole new way. So that was you. You've been called. Now, before we go to Christ, let me come back to you, Christian. And to those of you that are not Christian, let me explain why this is so incredible. It's a miracle that you've been called. It's a miracle that you hear the call, and it's a miracle that you can respond to the call. Because the you here is also the you of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, all the way up through verse 10. It's the you that, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, you who have been chosen, you who have been predestined, you who were dead in your sins, but now are alive in Christ, you've received the miracle of grace that God chose you by grace. You were called 
by Almighty God. You were cleansed by the cross. You were literally allowed to be the church who's commissioned to go to the world. This is the you. And so if you don't understand and appreciate the miracle of God's grace here, it's not you. Everyone who is in the church, in this you, has been captured by grace, and they know it. They know it. If that's not you, then that's not you. As we shift now, as again, we're still in the verse. For to this you have been called. Now let's focus on Christ. Because, because Christ also suffered. Notice here, we're now drawn to the cross, the cross of Christ. He suffered for you, and it's personal. It's for you. This is the gospel. This is the substitutionary atonement process. This is where one who was innocent and pure died, suffered and died, and more than just died, drank the cup of God's wrath for every beloved child of God. So Christ suffered far more than you and I could ever imagine, and he did it with a purpose for you. Hebrews 12 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Consider him for the joy set before him, for saving your soul and its joy to him. For that reason, he endured the cross. Friends, I pray you begin to see now in the gospel, everything is centered on Christ and his cross. He is the core of all things. And for those who are dead in their sins, there is no call that comes without Christ and his cross. That it is almighty God who is doing this work. And that's the big idea for today, that you need to understand that there is no gospel or true Christianity without Christ, his cross, and what you'll soon see is our miraculous cross-carrying. So here we see, for this you have been called because the reason why you've been called to this suffering, serving, submitting, and surrendering, the reason why you've been called to be the beloved, blessed, is because Christ also suffered, and he did it for you. This is a portrait of the sacrificial atonement system. This is where the blood of Christ washes the family of God clean. This is where the cross becomes so prominent. Why you cannot have a crossless Christianity. A crossless Christianity is a Christless Christianity. If that's un acceptable, if you find that to be distasteful, for those that say, hey, that's too much, I just want a nice moralistic world and a God that kind of allows me to find my way on my own. That's not Christianity. This is what is becoming the poison in so many liberal, self-proclaiming Christian churches that are not Christian churches. This is where you see a lack of commitment to the word, the will, and the ways of God. Because here, God's scripture says, and it's in concert and consistent with the rest of the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis 3.15, where we see the first foretelling of the gospel. This is where we see, because Christ suffered also, and he did it for you, Christian. This has a huge impact on us. Think about it. If you understand Christianity, or you think you understand Christianity, or you think you understand the gospel, and it does not involve the exclusive, the holy substitution of Christ for your sins, if you don't understand that the only way you get to heaven is through the cleansing substitute of Christ's death on your behalf, which you receive as a gift of grace. Nothing you have done, nothing you can do will put you in the place that makes it worthy for Christ to die for you. No, it's a pure 
gift of grace. It's all love, all grace, all mercy. Nothing that is done on our behalf brings God to the place where he's obligated to do this for us. We can never get to the place where we've earned or made ourselves worthy of this substitute. He suffered for you by grace out of love as a part of his divine design. Well, let's move now into the next piece. If we understand that he died and suffered for us Christians, then we continue on and realize it was to set an example, to leave an example. Well, this too now has a whole nother set of responsibilities and privileges attached to it. Notice, if you've been given an example, that has implied in it the understanding that you are to follow that example. That implication is about to be explicitly declared as it is in other parts of the scriptures, right? That Acts 1.8, you've received the Holy Spirit so that you'll be empowered to be his witness, to follow his example, to literally, as Jesus said in Matthew 4.19, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said it throughout the Gospels. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, all authority, says Jesus, in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, you now go in my authority and you make disciples of me. You not only baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but you teach them to obey everything that I commanded, to follow in my steps, to obey every aspect of Christ's likeness. And then he says, don't worry, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So please see here that the teaching is simple and clear and repetitive. It's just in conjunction with being simple, it's impossible. It's simple and impossible if you don't have this surrendered, suffering if need be, surrendered relationship to Jesus the Christ. But in him and with him, what is impossible without him, this simple is now more than possible, it's guaranteed Philippians 4.13, I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength. 2 Peter 1.3, I have received everything I need for life and godliness. These are two of the repeated truths and promises and guarantees of Almighty God. Very simple, right? When you understand these verses, you realize that the Christian has everything. The only thing the Christian does not have is an excuse because of the simple truth and love of God's word. And now it's also clear we have an example. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. This is how we love. This is how we live. We live like Christ. We love like Christ. He says, leaving us an example so that, here's the purpose of the example, so that we might follow. Follow is to obey. Follow is to be like. And how much do we obey? How Christ-like are we aiming to be? It's amazing how this works. He says literally that we follow in his footsteps. The word example here in the Greek, it really underscores this understanding and this application. For the word example, it's used from a school setting. And if you think even in our day, when you take a very young child and you begin to teach them how to write, oftentimes what will be done is the teacher will put the letters or the words on a piece of paper and then tell the young child, the student, to trace over those samples that have been given. And the learning process comes 
as the young child and student literally traces over exactly what the teacher has laid out. That's what the word example here means in the Greek. It's to trace over for the purpose of learning. So you have a double, a double here. Again, repetition. God is saying that he suffered for you to leave an example for you to follow in exacting, in tracing over format. In other words, in walking in the very footsteps of our Lord, that this is the call of the gospel. It's to recognize that we all need the miracle. We were dead. So if we're going to hear and heed a call from God, it's only because he's given us life. He's given us the miracle of allowing us to hear and heed. And then who is it that's doing the calling? And what exactly is the call? Well, it's the one who bore the cross, the one who suffered. The creator Christ at the cross, see him calling you, Christian, calling you to this, calling you to follow him, to live like him, to love like him. His mission, his method, his message becomes yours as you follow in his steps, literally tracing as best you can the life of Christ. And before you say, well, I can't do that. I'm not God. Yes, you can, because God is in you. And if you are a Christian, you have no excuse that he says, I'll be with you because I'm in you. My spirit is in you, empowering you to be my witness. I am with you so that you can be my witness to the world. And you can do all things that I've called you to in me and in my strength. Do you see this, friends? We describe this in the Bridge family. I have long shared this in a way that now I want to bring to you one more time and help you to see it as we unpack and apply this. For to this, for to this you have been called. See what is in the Stickman Gospel. You, marked by the X, you're the dead person. You're the dead person who has been called to this. To what? To the barrier that's right there. To the battle, to the spiritual warfare, to getting through the mess of this world that you can get to Christ and live for Christ. For to this you have been called. There's an arrow. There's a drawing you to from death through spiritual warfare to a Christ who is suffering. For to this you have been called. First notice, you need a miracle. You cannot do this without God lovingly, graciously acting upon you. Dead people make no decisions. Dead people don't do anything but die and rot. So if you are able to respond, if you are amongst the beloved, if you're going to surrender. You can't even surrender on your own. It's a gift of grace. Again, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, my favorite place to share and describe the gospel. You've been saved by grace. If you're saved, you've been saved by grace through faith. Here's the human responsibility. And as God is drawing you, John 6, 44, as the Father is drawing you to Christ, you respond by faith with repentance and belief. This is that first part of the gospel. It's understanding and acknowledging. Listen, this spiritual battle, this spiritual warfare, it all comes under the initial umbrella of God's sovereignty. It began this battle with Satan. It gets lived out through sin. It's very personal and individual in that every person has to deal with the self that is embracing and engulfed in sin and needs to respond next to the Savior. And truly, as we see here, come and respond to that call. And as we'll see, understanding that there will be seducers, 
Satan is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for souls to devour, to prevent the responding to the call. His minions come down disguised as angels of light, trying to enforce and enhance the spiritual battle. That's part of the reality of this warfare, of this call. You need the miracle of God's grace to draw you to himself. Otherwise, you'll never get there. There's a very real war happening. And as you respond by faith through the grace of God, and you answer that call by confessing, repenting, and believing, well, then you come to the second part of the gospel. Amen. You come to Christ. You come to his cross because Christ also suffered for you. He doesn't just call us. He empowers our ability to come. You see this again, that the cross of Christ separates and divides everything in the world. It's the cross. If you look on the left, what you'll find is death and darkness. You'll find those that are on the broad road heading to hell. You'll see everything that exemplifies what you don't want. You have hopelessness, helplessness, hurt, horror, and hell. And on the other side of the cross, here you see help and hope and healing. Friend, you see all that we hope for. You see the holiness of God and heaven to be the home of those who live on that right side of the cross. The role of the cross in everything, it's always at the center. It's where things change. All of time is divided in the Western world through the cross of Christ. All of eternity will be divided forever for all human beings based on the cross, based on Christ. Because Christ also suffered for you, it is to understand that the gospel requires the miracle of saving grace that can only come through the one who suffered, the perfect one who died that you and I might live, church. It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21. The old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ. In Christ, because verse 21, when you look at the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the family of God, for he the Father made him the Son, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the very righteousness of God in Christ. This cross is everything. He suffered and he sacrificed to be the substitute for the church, for the true Christian. So we have a miracle that only comes through the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Jesus said it, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Think about John 3, 36, another verse that for me could be a life verse. Those who believe have life, but those who do not obey do not have life. Instead, the wrath of God remains or abides on them. So everyone to the left of the cross still has the wrath of God on them. And only those who believe, as defined by obedience, are those that are going to have genuine life. So it's a way of understanding the fullness of the gospel. And we see this with the second little arrow and the call to pick up our cross and follow Christ, as we see here, so that we might have an example. For you have been called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. The example? What's the example? that we follow in his footsteps. We pick up our cross the way Christ picked up his cross, and we follow him. And again, let me give it to you biblically. It's Jesus who says in Luke 14, 27, unless you are willing to pick up your cross every day and follow me every day, you cannot be 
my disciples. And what does that following look like? Jesus told us in John chapter 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, so now I send you. So we are called to live the mission of the Almighty. We are called to live in Christ's likeness, not just in our ability to submit and serve and suffer, but to go and tell and make disciples and go locally, regionally, and globally, and go as sheep amongst wolves, being as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. We go and be the church. We proclaim the gospel to all the world. We make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. This is what you see. It's to be a missionary on mission. You see here the simple and the repeated message of our Messiah. You need a miracle. Only the Messiah gives that true miracle. And where and when that true miracle has taken root in the heart, that person and those people will be on mission as my missionaries, making disciples, sharing the glory of God for the glory of God, going out trying to find the lost and grow the found by loving God, loving people, and serving the world, making those disciples who will multiply as disciple makers, always holding to the word, the will, and the ways of God, making sure that each person is truly impacted and miraculously transformed in their head with truth, in their heart with love, and through their hands with the work and the warfare that brings glory to God as his ambassadors, as the salt of the earth, as the light to the world, as the very family of God, that we will show the world his glory in large part through our love for him and our love for one another, that we will love up, we will love in, and like him sacrificially, we will love out all that he will receive glory as we share the story of his grace and his gospel. As we have received, so shall we give. Friend, I pray that on this day, as we walk through 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might walk in the footsteps of our Christ and our King. I pray that you see and now better understand your need all people's need for the miracle of his saving grace. And if you are in his saving grace, it is by faith, not of works, so that no one can boast. This is Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. You've been saved by grace through faith, not of works, so that no one will boast or brag. And at the same time, verse 10, you have been saved for good works that the Lord prepared for you and me as his workmanship before time began. This is a beautiful tension that explains that the miracle of saving grace is needed. It's given by grace and received through faith in Christ alone as the Messiah. Only Christ can save. And if and when that is you, you will imperfectly but passionately follow him. 1 John 2.6 says, Those who claim to be in Christ must walk as Jesus walked. And at the same time, embracing the gift of Romans 8.1, which declares, For all who have come to and through the cross of Christ, every adopted child of God who will have bad days, who will struggle and who will stumble, no matter what, if you've truly been adopted, you'll never be brought back to the orphanage, and it means that there is no condemnation in you as a child of the king, even on your worst days. That, again, is the holy tension of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. 
when you put those together, another one of the verses that just lights up my heart and helps to guide my life is 1 John 3.18, where it's God's word that says, let us not love with word and tongue, but in action and in truth. Let us be the real deal. How? By the grace of God, picking up our cross and following him, dying to ourself, dying to our fleshly desires, dying to the ways of the world, and fully embracing. That's what a cross is. A cross is a means of death. Fully embracing, as Paul did in Galatians 2.20, the fact that we have no longer given life to our worldly wants. We have died. We have been crucified with Christ, and we no longer live. But instead, our life is lived in and through Christ as we carry our cross to follow him and to show the world that he's worth it, that the glory story of his grace and gospel, which includes our surrendering, submitting, sacrificing, serving, and even suffering. He is worth it. We don't carry it like it's something that we have to do. We carry our cross because we get to. And we realize that for a little while, 1 Peter 1, for a little while, we will be grieved by various trials. They can't even begin to compare to the richness of the glory of our God and his gospel. Friend, I pray that today has helped you to understand the faith that represents and defines the family of Almighty God. It's called the gospel, that we who have no hope and are truly destined to an eternal hell because of the sin that is in us, we can, by the grace and love of Almighty God, receive a miracle of saving grace, eternal life, John 3, 16, through the sacrifice and the atoning work of Jesus the Christ and his cross. That miracle is only available through the miraculous work and grace of the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Christ means Messiah, the anointed one, the holy one, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And when that truth becomes yours, you will want to walk with him and for him. You'll count it a privilege to carry the cross of Christ. You'll be his ambassadors. You'll be his family. Together, we will be this family. When you see this truth, whether it's in 1 Peter 2 verse 21, whether you look at it through the teachings and the clarity of Ephesians chapter 2. Wherever you get it from the scriptures, you'll find it all the way throughout over and 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 over again. I pray the simple truth, the simple call of the gospel will arrest your attention, realign your passions, and define and describe you every single day recognizing that you are in a war, and it is the gospel that defeats the enemy. It is God's truth and love that wins in spiritual warfare, and it is the gospel of Jesus the Christ that saves souls. No other way, no other help, but no one and nothing can stop this word, will, and way of God. No one and nothing can hinder what he has destined to be true. My advice, my admonition, my exhortation to you is to cry out to Christ. Cry out to Christ that you will receive this miracle from the Messiah and become his missionary. And for those of you who are his missionaries, continue to cry out, not for salvation, but for sanctification, that you're refining and you're refreshing will continue, that you'll go deeper and farther for the glory of God as you better understand his grace and his gospel. This is our message and our method, truth and love lived and shared, all as a demonstration of our having heard 
the simple call of the gospel, and more importantly, having heeded the simple call of the gospel, and that we do it by grace for the glory of God. Lord, I pray that each one within the sound of my voice has perhaps a new and better understanding of the simple call of the gospel. And for those who have not heard or have not heeded in the past, it's my prayer that you will reach out and touch, grab those that up to this point have been resistant, have been adversarial, have been your enemies. May they become your lovers, your followers, your family. And help me and every other Bridge family member, every true Christian, to live with passion, this sense of purpose, that we have been called to this. Because you too suffered, and you left us this example. May we follow in your footsteps, no more, no less, no matter what. Amen and amen.